Hey guys. We're live. Excellent. Like, you know, it was like one second before we started. Oh. This is amazing just in time uh, planning. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, super welcome. We're um, live with Reinventing NFTs with Polkadot. Um, and uh, we have with us three uh, great builders in the Polkadot ecosystem around NFTs. Um, and I'm going to let you guys uh, introduce yourself uh, in, um, in uh, just a bit. Or, uh, well, no, let's just start off with that. So, yeah, I'm uh, going to ask you for a uh, one ish minute intro. Who are you? What are you building in the Polkadot ecosystem? Um, starting off with, uh, with Ray. Hey, uh, thanks, Aaron. Hi, Bruno. Hey, Alex. Hey, everyone. I'm Ray. I'm a co founder of Big Country. Uh, Big Country enables everyone to start their own metaverse uh, with the games. So, we are more focused on the gaming side. Uh, we also have something uh, like a social token and a DAO. Uh, so we particularly uh, attract to those influencers and the community owners. They want to use uh, Big Country to manage the fans, bring their engagement to uh, a new level, specific to Web 3.0. Uh, so far, we finished our Web 3 grants, doing the second round, uh, complete our seed raise, uh, busy building our testnet. So the testnet will be launched uh, actually just next week uh, with some internal users only. Of course, you know, a lot of work needs to be done. We look at going live in the first quarter next year. Uh, our team mostly based in New Zealand. We have some members in UK and San Francisco. Um, uh, on the other hand, we also run the Substrate Academy with Arcala uh, for the portal ecosystem. So. We train about uh, over 100 software developers every quarter. So that's uh, in a nutshell about us. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Ray. Big country. We'll hear more about it. Um, Bruno, let us know. Yeah. Hi. What are you, what are you building? Um, yeah. Um, we are Remark. We are building um, software that will enable seamless teleportation of non fungible assets across every parachain that supports. Um, this type of standard and we've also upgraded the nft paradigm to support nested nfts um, multi-resource nfts and a lot of other fun stuff that nfts have never been able to do before um, my personal history is with ethereum 2.0 for a while um, back in the day then at the web3 foundation doing technical education and um, remark from this year uh, onward awesome Thanks. That was a whole mouthful on uh, what you're doing. I uh, admire your ability to say all those words after each other, but uh, we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, yeah, so Alexander, where you yeah. really going? Yeah, I'm trying to, uh, uh, w when I talk about Polkadot ecosystem, I always try to talk about other projects and uh, specifically what Bruno is doing. And it's always a mouthful because it's all big words. But anyway, I'm Alexander. Um, I created uh, the team that created the Unique Network, which is the NFT chain for Polkadot and Kusama ecosystems. Um, it is, uh, uh, just as Substrate is third generation blockchain, uh, our unique network is the next generation NFT chain that will be in a give uh, the next generation infrastructure for these kinds of, uh, you know, uh, NFTs that are uh, alive, that are moving around, that are doing things, playing games, real games and doing all those things. Cool. Thanks. So we have, I don't know how the, the sequence is on, on your screen, but for me, it's uh, uh, BitCountry. Uh, Remark and uh, Unique Network. It's actually other way all, around. All first. crossed out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's not consistent. Um, yeah, all, all, all builds on Polkadot. And um, I guess um, NFTs, of course, we've seen a huge uh, boom recently, huge growth in, in usage of the, the methods to, to build tokens, to sell tokens, to, to build functionality around uh, those non fungible tokens. Um, but if you look at like what what do those NFTs actually do? How are they constructed? Um, I heard someone earlier today. Uh, I think it was Andrew. Like he's uh, uh, saying, well, we're we're basically uh, selling uh, overpriced JPEGs or buying overpriced JPEGs. In some cases, you could argue that is the case. It's just an image. It's some metadata, and yes, there's uh, an on-chain reference, um, but that's it. 
Um, but there's so much more possible because you have like on-chain programmability. Now, um, we all know that the, the more heavy use chains that live for a longer time uh, have uh, quite a, a limited uh, capability to actually use that because of costs and all other things. Um, with you know the Polkadot ecosystem, there's uh, uh, this, this green field almost taking, like you say, third generation blockchain, um, taking all of those learnings from, from other blockchains and building a more scalable way to, to yeah, build on-chain logic and uh, interchain uh, communication, especially within the Polkadot ecosystem, of course. So, yeah, really excited to um, to dive deeper uh, into what uh, what kinds of NFTs and what kind of NFT applications can be possible in in such a world. Um, and um, and I'm just gonna uh, briefly pause before that because, um, like Anna mentioned briefly on the previous panel, and like you can see down here um, uh, at Outlier, we've always been as uh, a multi-chain we've all had, always had a multi-blockchain view to the world and you can probably see that in the the, the teams and uh, that we work with and the investment that we've made over time um and we're very excited about the launch of Polkadot and everything uh, developing there so much so that uh, we are now happy to unveil something that's been long in the world uh, in the works which is the Polkadot Basecamp accelerator so a dedicated accelerator program for people teams building uh things in polkadot ecosystem um so press that cta and uh, learn more um but do stick around of course for this uh, exciting discussion um i'm uh, um uh, bruno when we uh, had a brief uh, prep call for uh for for this uh, panel um you mentioned what what you guys had done around uh um i think it was canaria like the where you uh broke kusama twice um, that is an, an awesome feat. Um, can you tell the audience a bit more about that uh, and, and the numbers? And for the uninitiated, Kusama is what is called the canary net for Polkadot. So it's a live network, a main network, where it's a move fast and break things. Um, whereas Polkadot, the religion is a more move slowly and let's make sure this stuff really works. Um, but um, yeah, with that uh, um, intro, what, uh, what did you guys do there? Yeah, uh, so one of the innovations that we pushed out is on-chain emoting, where you can basically send an emote like you would in a, in a social media message or, or a messenger service, uh, but to any NFT. And this lets you, this, this, this adds some cool social mechanics to the, to the game, like um, just generally any UI, any app integrating the remark standard will automatically support these emotes. And so it's kind of like cross-platform emoting on people's art. Um, this is not only fun, but it's also a great price discovery method where you can actually find out that an, an, an NFT is more worth than like an almost identical copy of it purely by the emotions that it's evoking in people and the emotes that they're sending in. Um, what we did there was we ran a contest. We, we, had a, we, had this, um, we used the emote feature in two ways. One was that during our initial collectible offering when we were selling our NFTs, um, people could send in emotes to digital eggs and these emotes would affect the bird that would hatch from these eggs. And this was a very popular feature with people sending in tens of thousands of emotes to influence the look and feel and functionality of their bird. Uh, the other one was a top emoted contest where all uh, were 40 of the most emoted eggs would get secondary art. So fancy commissioned art from artists that would go through an additional art contest, yada, yada, and uh, end up with some like high profile art. Um, as a result. And um, both of these put together resulted in users sending in more than a, a million and a half emotes in total over the span of like a month and something. Um, each of these was a separate transaction on the Kusama network. Um, needless to say, on Ethereum, where a single interaction with an NFT of any type is uh, half a dollar on a good day, that's like a sub 20 guay day. Um, this would cost many, many hundreds of thousands of dollars. But here it was like maybe $2,000 in total cost for, for the entire 1.5 million, I think, um, if we only take into account uh, when the price reduction happened on Kusama with the runtime upgrade. Um, however, this was so popular that it actually broke Kusama twice. So we had so many transactions in the queue that nodes started failing because they couldn't clear their transaction queue fast enough. And so, um, a fix was issued for that, and then we did it again uh, a few weeks later when 
two parachains actually stopped producing blocks because they couldn't handle the now oversized blocks that were processed by Kusama, their parent relay chain. So this is, this is a fun experiment in scaling and very similar to the early days of NFTs on Ethereum where CryptoKitties kind of broke Ethereum with popularity. So you could say that Kusama just went through its own, you know, like beneficial DDoS phase um, or CryptoKitties phase w in, in, in its growth cycle. Yeah, that, that's amazing. So it's like, um, just to unpack that, you had one and a half million on-chain transactions that uh, like influenced how certain NFTs came to be. Is that right? Uh, yes. The, the emails were taken into. In, yeah, they influenced future functionality of newly minted NFTs that would be the result of these interactions, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, we, we, I guess we've seen, you know, uh, some level of interaction with people uh, around NFT systems, which then usually would be, okay, uh, people interact with the Web2 system, which is highly scalable. And then on the back end, you have, you know, NFTs being minted. And yes, there's some unchanged un functionality, but like this is uh, really impressive. And it also, on the other hand, shows how, uh, what canary net means in practice. Yes, it can break. But then it's, uh, it stands up quickly, hopefully, hopefully, and uh, more resilient. Um, uh, yeah, very cool. And um, so a question for you, uh, uh, Ray, like uh, those, those, those NFTs, um, they, they're, uh, they're advanced, they, they can be minted, they can be created. Um, can people use them in, in, in their base country or in a base country or uh, and what would that look like? Yeah, so our use case of NFT, firstly, we want to support all the uh, popular standards. You know, we already talked to uh, these two gentlemen in the past. Uh, you know, it's all about, you know, how can we make use of NFT inside our metaverses and the games? Um, firstly, you know, the NFTs, you know, you, you mint it elsewhere. You know, if we open the protocol, allow the transfer, they can arrive here and then people can place them in the 3D world and also use the game use as a prizes uh, if people winning uh, certain games. Uh, of course, blockchain based the game because that's more fair rather than, you know, because in the gaming world, the challenges, there are a lot of bots. Yeah, so the NFT protocol will be interoperable and also we can bridges, you know, work with the other blockchain uh, as well. Uh, that's outside of the substrate and Polkadot with some ecosystem. Yeah, I'll give you one example of NFT, you know, NFT can be used as a uh, if you win the prize that's used as a key to the, another stage of the game or have a certain uh, privilege to have a, a higher you know level of access so yes yeah, so nft has become the digital goose in our project on our network uh where it's token like a currency right nowadays so anything else that we want them to openly trade it uh will turn it into nft such as you know uh, we want to create a new asset class called the big entry itself itself it contains a, a map and land and virtual world and community uh hopefully that you know in, in the future <laughs> uh, other platform will recognize as a new asset class can, can be listed as a separate category so but yeah uh, nft as a digital goods and items are a big part of that uh, big substance of the uh, you know supporting the value of that big country great thanks um alexander i, I want to um, uh, switch to you for a bit uh, um on um like what what kinds of we, we heard some you know pretty advanced capabilities of uh, of nfts or how uh, that can be used to create nfts um what kinds of capabilities have you seen that that's uh, that lack in in current um mostly used systems and standards and uh are you building and including in the the functionality of uh, unique network and yeah ideally you yeah, have some some concrete examples that'd be great for people to uh, to understand how it comes to be sure thanks aaron so uh the way i like to say things about the current state of nfts and uh uh is that we are in web one era we are like in a, a place back in you know 1999 or 2000 when you know you can sell the books and that's it with the internet uh in nfts you can mint a file you can uh, you know sell the file and pretty much that's it um and what uh the power of substrate the technology that uh, polkadot is built on and all of us work on um is in its flexibility so you can do a lot of things uh, a lot of different ways and hack it or kind of build new infrastructure 
that can uh, that can uh, really provide the next generation of infrastructure, um, which is needed. So you know, NFTs are representation of unique assets. You have to have a lot of customization on that to make them really live. Just like we had Web2 come in and enable things that we have today on the internet, Fa Facebook wouldn't be possible on on uh, uh, Web1. Uh, today, you know, you cannot have uh, games like and metaverse is like what Ray's building uh, on uh, on Ethereum. You just cannot. Uh, you need much more flexibility. So uh, we use that flexibility already to build in some things, and I can go on for a long time talking about it. But let me mention just first we, what we did. Uh, the first uh, uh, barrier to NFTs becoming something really kind of live is the fact that. Um, the implementations, Ethereum and everybody else, uh, is very opinionated and tells you, you you know, every user that comes in has to pay for every transaction fee they, they come on, you know, uh, when they want to do something on blockchain. Uh, that's all nice because techies kind of figure out that's the only way to uh, prevent the spamming of the network, okay? We've seen, you know, with Bruno's example, when the transactions are cheap, what can happen? But uh, you can actually prevent the spam many different ways. And you can, uh, starting by creating a scalable uh, technology, which these guys are doing, uh, but also uh, you know, you can, uh, uh, games are very good at managing their, their users. So we built native support for transaction fee sponsoring, uh, so that every game can take and, uh, hide the blockchain under the hood so that, uh, what we've seen with, uh, NBA top shots can be used in any game where uh, people are actually playing a game where they're sending emoticons that can be free that doesn't have uh that doesn't need to have a, a transaction fee associated with it um the users you know uh we have maybe 10 20 million crypto people in the world but we have billions of gamers so let's address those billions first okay so uh that uh native sponsoring of transaction fees is something very very powerful for people uh, for creatives to uh, appeal to, first of all, to creatives who don't know stuff about blockchain and to mass audiences who will use that. They will all, just like in NBA Top Shots, all the buyers, they know they're buying an NFT, but they're not seeing that. They're not kind of worrying about it, right? So, you know, that's kind of the killer feature number one. There's four or five we already did, and there's like long line of things we, can, uh, we, we plan to do over the next year or two. Great, thanks. Yeah, so that, that's... Um uh really opens up uh using nfts and um uh you yeah and certain nft use cases which would theoretically be possible uh now become practically possible because that barrier is taken away of every of those billion users having a wallet having that all set up and having you know some some token in their wallet to 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 start off with um you can start off without any of that or well, you need a wallet probably something that interacts with the system but um, you can then go on to uh, to sort of dive dive deeper into the the, the rabbit hole of uh, self sovereign yeah, holding your assets in a self sovereign way, or just you know go uh, go about and uh, and use your your emoji or, or yeah your uh, lightweight interactions with the system and, and still have you know a full um, and on chain experience. Um, on that note of on chain, um, what we've seen with uh, the, the the web 1.0 generation of uh, of nfts as uh, as you as you called it so the, the sort of the first wave of nfts is that um often a large part of what is the actual nft doesn't live on on the blockchain itself uh, because of you know limited capacity limited storage limited availability of uh the centralized storage systems um uh, how does that play out in in uh, well I guess in the Polkadot ecosystem in general? What what possibilities are there? Are you, are you seeing to make NFTs more on chain or fully on chain, and even their relationships be on chain or their their future value streams? Um, and uh, within your own uh, projects and technologies, what's uh, what are some things that that you're doing to uh, enable a more off chain experience? And I'll leave it open to once ago first. Otherwise, I'll. Uh, I'll point to either of you. Hey, yeah, there we go, Bruno. Okay. 
Um, so right now with Remark 1.0, we're using IPFS um, like most decentralized NFT storage systems do. We pin the images for the users and the resources and if they upload a movie or a song or whatever else or a PDF, we pin it for them. We also pin it to our own node and we pin it to Piñata as a commercial service. Um, however, this does uh, leave it to chance that if you know, like it becomes unpinned everywhere and nobody has looked at it for a while, it, it disappears. I'm of the opinion that art that isn't looked at for a very long time is not art at all and it's not art worth keeping around. So it's not that big of a shame if it disappears. But uh, Remark 2.0 allows more resilience and more fallbacks in that since we have multi-resource NFTs that allow you to have different resources for the same thing. So for example, I can mint an ebook and that ebook can have an audio file as a resource, a PDF file as a resource, and a high resolution cover as, an email, uh, as a resource. Um, and depending on the context in which you load it, that resource gets loaded. If I load that NFT into Audible, it plays. If I load it into Singular, which is our marketplace, you get to read it because we have the PDF reader built in. And if you load it into OpenSea, then you, you see the high resolution cover so you can trade it. Uh, but this can be used in different ways as well. So for example, you can have one resource that is actually uh, an, an image. Let's say that we're talking about an NFT that's a, that's a digital image, an expensive JPEG. And so uh, this image can have one resource that's on IPFS, one resource that's on Rweave, one resource that's on Sia coin, one resource that's on file, uh, Filecoin, um, and whatever else other network exists out there. And so now you have four fallback resources of the same thing on the same NFT. And so now you can just flip through them. If one of them dies, you have the other ones as a backup. And this is natively supported with all multi-resource NFTs on Remark. So um, this is kind of like we are putting it in the user's hands. We don't want to take over, take, take up too much responsibility here. Like right now we are pinning everything and you know, everything's in, in, our, in our hands. We, we make sure it's, there's longevity there. But if you like, if we go to a team retreat and our bus falls off a cliff, your NFTs will disappear in three months. Um, so with these fallbacks and everything that we're adding with Remark 2.0, people will have it in their own hands. Um, it's their responsibility, but it's made much easier. Great. Well, I hope that your uh, uh, next team retreat will be a bit more fortuitous than that. But in just in case, that's very good to hear. But yeah, it's an interesting approach to like, uh, firstly, of course, multi-assets. Um, assets uh, according to context. If you're in an audio environment, it's audio. If you're in a 3D environment, um, it's 3D. Um, but even uh, using the, that to uh, make it redundant over multiple storage backends, that's that's uh, it's a really great approach. Um, I um, uh, I, I want to focus a bit more uh, on uh, on gaming. Um, I think uh, within uh, within big country, um, you uh, th that's you know, one area of focus. Um, maybe there's there are some things that you can say from the top end on like uh, types of gaming use cases that are being built or that you're building for. Um, mm -hmm. Then we can dive a bit deeper on that. So we have a uh, two contexts of uh, gaming uh, inside big country. Uh, because currently the metaverse project, you, a part of virtual world, people can build in there. You know, they need some souls inside that world, right? And we think games can be the content. You know, that's uh, engaging the users. Um, at a global network level, we're creating a uh, play-to-earn uh, economy model for for a, a main kind of a game, the main game mode. Uh, allow people to uh, uh, mining for resources, use the resources to build on top of the uh, the land inside the virtual world. Um, and then, you know, of course, people want to save their time. They don't want to mine the resources, which is time consuming, right? Uh, of of course, we also create an anti bot system that bot is dis disincentivized to uh, uh, to to mine the resources. Basically, they don't want to have a multiple accounts either. And then they create the economy that you, you sell your resources to the developer. The developer can just buy the resource by saving time and build it on the land and then uh, adding value to the land because you know uh, they can treat that as NFT in the future uh, on other platforms. You know, either you know any any NFT uh, platforms you know that we support, a standard we support. The other game mode is that we are currently building a plugin architecture. That's a, a new uncharted area. Uh, that we tap into allowing user to create a games using uh, assembly script, web assembly, uh, both on the client side and the server side, so that 
uh, each big country on the land, they can create their own game using our uh, API and uh, deploy it to the land. So people, uh, for example, you walk into uh, like a store that's selling X or uh, something that, you know, uh, they can create a game or they can play, do something with the app. I mean, it's up to the user to uh, to do that. Of course, uh, you know, the apps, you know, the stuff that we'll, we'll load inside of our uh, main app, uh, those scripts need to be audited. We want to use uh, governance feature to audit that. And also our tech technical committee should get involved to see that. Uh, and also we want to create an economy model that this encourage people to do bad things uh, with their with their app, with their game mode. Yeah, so in summary, that's we have a main game mode plus the user created the game mode. Uh, so that we found, we feel that it could be very interesting to adding more content and activities to the metaverse. And also allow you know um, our partners, you know friends, to uh, uh, encourage them to bring the NFTs uh, from their network and use that for their community or for their customer. So our our target customer are end users. We serve end users. Uh, at the same time, our stakeholders are the uh, community owners or project owners. So people who have a community. Um, so we create the functions to support them. That's why we come out with two game modes. Great, thanks. Um, and uh, Alexander, for you, um, like what what gaming related um, functionality um, do you do you have vision or do you see being built on a unique network? And I guess you, you, what you mentioned the sponsoring of uh, transactions, um, I guess that would be really an enable enabler. Um, and, and yeah, what what other things do you see there? Oh yes. So we uh, our first mission is to create freemium gaming on blockchain. Okay, so ninety percent or something like that, eighty percent of the gaming industry, so a few hundred billion dollars uh, is based on freemium economic model, and blockchains do not allow that. We do. So that's our first mission to allow uh, freemium gaming to happen on a large scale in uh, the blockchain space. Um, we do have a bunch of uh, other things that uh, gaming studios will understand. So things like scheduling, for example. In Ethereum, you cannot do that. Like you cannot, you know, have a user say, you know, I want this to happen and I want it to happen then. Bruno's X, they cannot hatch on, you know, on Ethereum on a, on a, a, a certain time in the future. In Substrate, you can, and we allow that for NFTs for gaming. That's kind of a, a no, no, a no brainer. Um, things like uh, so NFTs, uh, you know, the. Uh, a big part of gaming industry, again, a couple of hundred billion dollars, is uh, gaming studios making uh, these uh, in-game items and selling them, right? But uh, they're not selling them, they're leasing them, they're licensing them, and you know, you're stuck with them. You use them a little bit, five minutes or, or you know, half a year, and that's it. Uh, what blockchain intends to do is create completely new economic structure, right? About because you become an owner of that in-game item, and uh, you can move it around. No, no surprise there that big gaming studios are still pretty shy about breaking their existing business model. But uh, we are seeing, you know, we are starting to see big ones getting interested, and th because they know that th this disruption will change a lot of things and will create new, just simply new space for everybody. Um, so in that, you need, uh, you know, some creativity in order uh, and flexibility how you manage. The NFT assets. So one of the things we we implemented, for example, is separation of powers. So you take uh, administration rights to a collection and ownership uh, as separate items. And when you create a game, you can create a rules what administrators can do and what owners can do. Owners can be players and administrators can be the the, the uh, uh, you know the gaming studio that makes the game. Uh, it kind of uh, you know, creates a kind of a bridge where it's not like either or, uh, it's either the gaming studio that makes all the money or it's the uh, users who make all the money. It's kind of gives the bridge in between because you can play with those administrative rights. You can say, okay, you can own the thing, but you cannot, I don't know, if you sell it, you have to pay 10% to us or, or, you know, things like that. Great, thanks. So yeah. Um, 
with mission enabling freemium gaming on on blockchain and uh like reinventing nfts with polkadot that's you know really uh, um uh something that that polkadot enables for you um correct and um we're uh, um heading towards the end of the of the time for our panel um so i'm uh, gonna ask uh, bruno for uh, any uh, any closing remarks and while he does that uh, could you all uh, please type in the chat how you want people to reach you where you want people to find you um so uh yeah people can dive deeper into what what each of you are building um but yeah uh, bruno if maybe there's something around gaming uh with with remark maybe something else but uh, if there's uh, yeah something you want to leave our audience with um yeah sure so um I'm I'm a lifelong gamer. I'm a, I'm big on VR, and I'm really excited about the NFT future that we're building here. That will like augment this whole experience. Um, one of the things I'm most excited about is forward compatible NFTs that we're building, which means that you mint an NFT at one point in time without being aware of a future upcoming NFT project, and your past NFT can become compatible with it in terms of being a wearable item in it or a usable item in it and something like that. Um, this is described in some of the links I shared in the chat. You, you're, you're free to free, free to check those out. Um, but I would be happy to take you through the basics of all of this and show you some of the 2.0 functionality that's coming, including equipped NFTs and uh, multi-resource NFTs tomorrow in a crowdcast that we have and a link I'll share um, in the chat. And um, if you want to get in touch and explore this whole space, um, I encourage you to follow us on Twitter. It's just Remark App. Um, all together, all lowercase. Um, same thing on, on Telegram. Um, and just, you know, uh, get in touch, ask questions, suggest awesome projects, and uh, we can explore the, the universe together. Uh, I'll drop some links in the chat. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks. Great. Um, Ray, any um, final words to leave our audience with? Or where they can find you? It's Big yeah. Country, right? Yeah, Big Country. Uh, I'll have the link here. Um, yeah, first of all, thanks for the invitation, you know, to work with our friends from Polkadot. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, we, you know, I put a link here, every details uh, on the website. Um, uh, people can join for the early access. We do that by invitation to test out our offer system. Uh, and we have a active campaign running on the test net. Uh, either it's a collator node or operator campaign or using uh, uh, join our black box uh, campaign. So uh, we had uh, probably around 20,000 people participated. Some people lucky they got some prizes, some not. <laughs> uh, but we continue to push out new kind of campaigns, you know, until we launch our mainnet. So yeah, so yeah, everything will be published on the website. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks a lot. And um, any final words, Alexander? Well, if there are creators here, then uh, please reach out. Uh, we are kind of, our mission uh, is to uh, inspire innovation in the NFT space. Uh, you know, anything from uh, what uh, it, we heard earlier today, uh, Ouroboros, for example, is a great example of projects that uh, uh, are really innovating in the space and kind of making NFTs live. Uh, the, the, NFT space is up for a very, very big growth, uh, not just financially, that's the least part of uh, what's exciting, but of uh, becoming alive. So, and for that, we need a lot of creative people to do together. So please reach out. We'll be happy to support you any way we can. And, uh, uh, and we can a lot. So <laughs> happy to, uh, happy to talk with anybody. And uh, that's it. Thanks a lot, uh, everybody. Always a pleasure to be in the same room with you guys. Uh, this is an awesome party. Thanks a lot again. Great. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Alexander, for Unique Network, Ray, BitCountry, Bruno, Remark. Um, uh, this was the last panel of today, of the first day of the fusion. Um, but there will be closing words after this, and there will be poems. So you better stick around. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>